Welcome to the Good and Basic Podcast, a long-form conversation with Joseph and Joseph about wide, uh, varied, and I was going to say multifarious topics. Yes, it's quite idiosyncratic. Yes. Uh, this time around, we're talking about archaeology. Uh, we're recapping about two weeks' worth of videos. Last week, we talked mostly about Mos Maiorum, Fourth Generation Warfare, and some other stuff, so uh, now we're tackling all that Roman stuff, but from the perspective of um, archaeology and the game of archaeological interpretation. You can find our social media information in the show notes slash video description. As always, thank you very much for listening. We are super excited to talk about this today. It was a super fun trip, uh, super fun talking to Lindy Beige, and so um, let's let's jump right in. So the archaeological interpretation game. Yeah, uh, we were going through a museum with Lloyd for Lindy Beige, and uh, we were, it, the Vindolanda Museum is full of artifacts taken from the site itself, including the little slivers of wood that were basically Roman postcards. They mm-hmm. had little inscriptions in Latin with things like, Mom, thanks for the socks. <laughs> and so there's all these original artifacts. Yeah. And when an archaeologist pulls something out of the ground, they're in kind of a, a an interesting uh, stepchild of both history, the study of history, the written word, mm-hmm. and the st- and the hard sciences. Mm -hmm. And the trouble with archaeology is that it's not a repeatable experiment. Mm -hmm. You pull it out of the ground once, and you get to see exactly where it was lying and pull up all the contextual information only once. Mm -hmm. And then you are forced to try to interpret, or or rather that's the game, is to try to interpret what on earth what you're seeing means. How does that tell us about the way life was lived? How, How do you do that thing? And it exists in kind of this strange space in between um, hard sciences, the way we tend to understand them. I mean, you can analyze the chemical signatures of whatever it is you're pulling out of the ground. You can look very carefully at where things are distributed. You can take really careful Mm -hmm. notes. But then the next level is to say, okay, what does it mean? And for that, you're reading the landscape just like a tracker. Mm -hmm. And... uh, Some things are easy to interpret and have very clear, definitive answers. Um, Lloyd mentioned scales, sets of scales. If they work as scales and if they have standardized weights next to them, and I mean, they're scales. Not a lot to say about that. They're scales. But then you find a a, a giant board carved with a hole in the middle, and someone says, I think it's a toilet seat. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a big asterisk next to that because we're not exactly yeah, you sure. Can, well, you can disagree with that, right? Yeah. And and I no, I think you're absolutely right. Like the fact you dig up one Roman fort, that does not guarantee you'll be able to dig up another Roman fort. And even if you could dig up another Roman fort, it, you know, there's not a guarantee that they'll be from the same era. It's not even a guarantee that especially if they're from different geographical areas that you can carry over the assumptions from one to the other. Right. Right. In contrast to things like, you know, if you want to know what temperature water boils at, that actually is something that you can do as many times as you like you know, until you're satisfied about the answer. Yep. Right. But you can really only excavate Vindolanda once. Yep. Uh, and then you can reinterpret it as much as you want, but you don't get to pick the artifacts you find. Not really. Nope. Um, and you also don't get to, um, you don't get to pick the artifacts you find. And you also uh, don't really, I'm sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. You, um, <laughs> That's embarrassing. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, a, go ahead. There's a few massive selection biases that are interesting in yeah. archaeology. Uh, things made out of carbon tend to get eaten. And so in the soil, wood doesn't last very long unless you have very acidic soils or some other condition that preserves it well. Um, funny enough, I recently made a pair of replica sandals based off of a find from, from the U.S. Uh, in the Mammoth Cave System. There was a very unfortunate man who was mining salt about 4,500 years ago when a rock shifted and squished him. And um, very unfortunate for him, we're sorry for him, but very fortunate for us because he happened to get squished in the saltiest section of the mine. So his shoes were preserved, his clothing was preserved, and we found him more or less as it happened 4,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we were able to uh, date it reasonably well. There's a beef jerky joke here that I'm not going to make, but I'll leave it to our listeners. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. (laughs) But uh, I made replicas of his shoes, and that's kind of a cool thing to be able to uh, walk a mile in the shoes of someone from 4,500 years ago because in this particular case, it got preserved. So speaking of which, you reminded me what I was going to say. So another thing we happened to do, uh, I don't know if the videos, I don't know if slash when the videos will make it onto the channel, but we also visited the British Museum um, while we were over in the UK. And um, the, the... as we were walking through and looking at everything, the thought struck me that 90% of the things in there were metal, pottery, or stone, right? Um, 
And that's so strange because, you know, you, you have to think that pre-modern life in, in all epochs of the world it consisted of a lot of objects that weren't made of pottery, metal, or stone. The majority. Right, yeah. And so the 90% that we have is the 10% that they had. Yeah. And so, and so we're making, exactly, we're making inferences about uh, ancient life based upon an incredibly small and incredibly selected body of evidence. And that's just such an interesting problem, right? Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons why it's so interesting is because it seems, you know, in 90% of cases, unless you happen to have a very well-preserved person in a salt mine, uh, there's no way around that problem. Yep. You're not you know? wrong. There's no way around that problem. There's there's a huge problem with selection biases through time, and the selection biases are different based on climate. For instance, Egypt is really nice for preserving wood and papyrus, um, but a lot of people in Egypt lived in the delta, in the, the mm-hmm. massive fanning out uh, into the Mediterranean Sea, and there, papyrus does not preserve well. In fact, nothing preserves terribly well, and so you run into this problem that... Uh, in the area where a lot of people were living and a lot of Egyptian history happened, uh, the selection biases are harsher, and you don't preserve the interesting mm-hmm. bits that would would tell you about how they lived their lives. And you know, this this pops up not just in archaeology. This is a larger well. Oh, sorry. I mean, this is archaeology. What I'm about to say, but it's not human archaeology, right? Uh, you know, dinosaurs, leathery reptilian skin versus feathers, right? Or, you know, every now and again there'll be a picture that makes its rounds that makes the rounds on the internet of, of, of a dinosaur and the caption will be, Well, you know, we collect the bones of dinosaurs, but since the fleshy tissue has already rotted away, we don't actually know how big these things were. So the dinosaurs certainly could have been obese. They could have had like, you know, they, they may not have been like these lean reptilian creatures. They could have had like a lot more mass there and the mass is just gone. And I can't comment about the archaeological. That seems suspicious to me. I can't comment about whether or not that's true. For one thing, I did not live during the time of the dinosaurs for a second. In, in, in the second place, I'm not really an archaeologist. Um, but it does raise that interesting question of, okay, so just because you're seeing things doesn't mean you're seeing everything. There's a lot there that you're not seeing. And it's hard to weigh the value of the things that you're not seeing and the things that you're not even aware that you're not seeing Yeah. Right against the, against the things that you do have. I, I think that parallel between paleontology, ancient ancient life studies, and archaeology studies of ancient, of old humans, mm-hmm. that, that is a really interesting connection because it's roughly the same thing. I mean, it's mm-hmm. the same process. Um, I mean, I, I guess we would have more information in archaeology just because the time spans are smaller. but Which is nice. Yeah, that, that's a helpful thing. There's less time for those selection biases to happen. Although every now and again, you know, I, 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 don't, I believe every now and again they'll dig up a woolly mammoth excuse me, that's been preserved by the ice, right? So you actually can get the fleshy tissues yes. in some cases, right? Or like a mosquito that's, that's. Uh... no, am I, am I, I'm rehashing. That's Jurassic Park. Okay, uh, uh, c- confession. I've actually never watched the Jurassic Park movies. I know that's terrible of me, but I've never watched them. So apparently I just about, I, I, I was just about to rehash a movie plot as if it was real. So, okay. But in principle, it's the kind of thing that, that could happen, right? You could find living matter encased in amber. Okay, I'm, I'm. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not making a really good showing today. Um, no, this, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say that uh, one of the things that I find the most <laughs> interesting about, and maybe maybe this does relate to oh, the to the gaff about the Jurassic Park. Oh, my word. <laughs> you know, I, I was reading something. There have been some tests done where they were able to extract uh, chemically from fossils, fossilized bone, uh, mm-hmm cells and DNA degrades pretty fast. It's a massive hyper complicated molecule. And I don't know that they were able to recover uh, DNA. Among other things, you can't recover DNA from red blood cells. So that's, that's awkward. But um, recovering tissue from dinosaurs is something that we've, we've done a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, who knows if we ever get enough to actually clone them back to existence. But what, the thing that I like about archaeology and paleontology is both of them force you to be humble about your knowledge. Um, the study of knowledge in philosophy is referred to as epistemology. Episteme is a Greek word that means knowledge. And uh, there's this giant question in the, the philosophical study of knowledge, which is, how do you know if you really know something? Mm-hmm. Very philosophy type question yeah. to ask. And it's always and also kind of one that will run you in circles. If if you've never thought about this question before, and you start thinking about it, you'll kind of you'll kind of run around in circles for just a little. Well, I know it because I saw it. Well, why do you believe your eyes? Have your eyes ever lied to you? Yes, they have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you believe your eyes always? Well, 
what justifies your belief that your eyes are telling you the truth? Oh my gosh, I'm a brain in a vat. Mm-hmm. Well, and this is why um, I like 14 year old kids. Apologies to any 14 year old kids in the audience. I don't mean any. Uh, we also were once 14 year old kids. Most humans are who are above the age of 14. We're at 1.14. But but I mean, this is kind of the 14 year old who sees the Matrix and is like, whoa, man, like, is any of this even real? Kind of phenomenon, right? Yeah. Is running into these questions of epistemology for the first time. Yeah. Running into these questions of, okay, wait, 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 wait. What are the bounds of my knowledge, and how do I know that those are the bounds? There's a there's a quote. So it can run you in circles. The question of epistemology can run you around in circles, and you can mm-hmm. say, oh my gosh, I'm a brain in a vat, and I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. And that's not terribly productive. And so some people will dismiss the question entirely. But if you take it at a slightly less extreme end of the question, and I find the extreme end of the question actually be very fascinating and helpful. But at a less extreme level, you could say, um, just how much do I trust this piece of information Mm -hmm. based on everything else? Um, And that is incredibly helpful for uh, recognizing the boundaries of your own knowledge. Confucius had a quote where he said that true education is to know clearly uh, those things that you do know and to know clearly when you don't know something. Mm -hmm. So that the boundaries between the knowledge that you can say with a reasonable confidence and the knowledge that you Mm -hmm. just don't have to recognize the boundaries of your competence. Uh, You know, you just reminded me, when I uh, taught freshman writing courses at a university um, a while back, what I... One of the planning techniques that I recommended to my students is when you're facing an assignment, make two columns on a page, and on one side, write down all the things you know about the assignment. And then on the other column, write down all the things you don't know about the assignment. And it actually turns out that, um, that as you do that, as you write out the things you don't know, it forces you to to be more aware and to think about, oh, wait, this is a, this is a thing I don't know about this assignment that I need to know. And to be more and observant. And you start, you start realizing all the gaps uh, in your knowledge that you might actually need to fill in order to do the assignment. Um, and that's really helpful because sometimes when you face a big assignment, it's hard to sort. It, it, it's, it's hard to manage it because it's so large and many some parts are familiar to you and some parts are unfamiliar. But if you can start mapping those out and separating them, uh, it, it makes you more aware of the of the things that are lacking and gives you a direction of where to go next. There's actually a very similar assignment that I used with my uh, high school students. I used to teach junior high and high school uh, science classes and uh, fantastic experience, by the way. And one of the assignments that I had my students do weekly, because uh, part of part of what I was teaching was earth science, the other part of what I was teaching was the philosophy of science, like the grounding of science, the scientific method as the method itself. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the weekly assignments that I had them do was to go home and observe something for 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. And the assignment was to either draw it from two different angles, because draw, for, drawing it forces you to pay more attention to the detail of the object, or to write a full page of notes about it. Mm-hmm. And then the assignment wasn't complete until you wrote three questions about the object. Hmm. So I, I had some students who did really clever things. Like I had one who hid in a, his brother's closet and observed his uh, brother as though he was a wild animal for <laughs> longer than 15 minutes. And I thought as I was reading this, this is creepy. Points for originality, but yeah. this is creepy. <laughs> And others, uh, I had one student observe the carpet, and he, hmm. he observed which way the individual uh, carpet strands were twisted yeah. and tr- started wondering, okay, how are these actually attached to the backing? Mm-hmm. I don't actually understand carpet, mm-hmm. and I've been walking on this for how long? And then started mm-hmm. noticing that there were things in between the fibers down there and started saying, well, yuck. So, I mean, <laughs> th- this sort of uh, close observation, you're not paying attention until you have questions. Because mm. you don't know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know until you're, you're approaching it with a questioning mind. You're not paying attention until you have questions. And in some, on some level, right, a question is a proof of your ignorance and also a proof of your quest for knowledge. Yes. Because you, you actually cannot have a real question unless you don't know the answer, right? Which is why, which is why questions are so helpful. Which, it's because they lead you places you haven't been before. Which brings us to the Roman shields. <laughs> so... Uh, will you tell the story? Yeah. Um, so we're at uh, most of the videos that we've put up were filmed at Vindolanda, which is a Roman archaeological fort and site uh, near Hadrian's Wall in the UK. Um, the Roman Shield video was uh, actually filmed at Archeon. Sorry, couldn't remember the name for a second. Um, Archeon, which is a, an archaeological museum. You're going to have to fill in some of the details here because you're you're the one who's actually lived in the Netherlands for two years. But uh, it's an archaeological um, museum, open air museum in uh, the Netherlands. And the really cool thing about it in my mind is that um, it has archaeological exhibits from a wide span of human history. So you start in the Stone Age uh, and then move up through the medieval period. Um, 
with Rome in the middle. And, and so you, you can see these stages of human development in the same location, right? Which is something really cool that, for instance, Vindolanda does not have, right? Like you go to Vindolanda and you're like, this is Rome. You know, here we go, right? Uh, whereas at Archeon, you get this this incredible spread. Anyway, so we were at the Roman exhibit and, and one of the things that they have there, um, they, they have a few things there that you can interact with. One of them is these log canoes in the Stone Age area. That, that was so paddled cool. Around and actually, just so you know, log canoes are, are crazy maneuverable. I had no idea. They're very maneuverable. Uh, almost too maneuverable. I was spinning around in circles for a while. Um, <laughs> right? They're, they're hard to control. They're so maneuverable. Um, but in the Roman section, there's uh, one of the things they have there is shields, right? So we pick up the shield, right, and a helmet, um, and we start trying to figure out, okay, well, what is this thing for? Yeah. Right? And what would be the best way to use this? And what about it surprises us? Right? Um, and so one of the things we find is that the, the, the handle is sideways. Yeah. Right. And so we're like, okay, why is the handle sideways? Is that because they did it wrong and the original shield is vertical? Which, which is the question. So we're entering this and we have some genuine ignorance. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not going to hide from that. We have some ignorance about how these things were yeah, used. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but asking that question, that specific question, saying, okay, why on earth is the shield sideways? That seems wrong. Mm -hmm. And and we were, con I yeah. mean, there was a moment where, where, where you were thinking that that was a mistake that the museum had yeah. made. Yeah. 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 Um, well, and now the thought occurs to me, basically, it's, you know, it's the same thing toddlers do when they explore the world and stick things in their mouth. I did not stick that shield in my mouth for good reasons, um, but, but I did like pick it up and heft it, right? Like you're, you're exploring the world around and you're figuring out, okay, what is this object? What does it do? What can we use it for? Um, mm -hmm. What are its, what are its properties? How does it behave when it interacts with other objects, right? Uh, and that's that, I mean, that's fundamentally what we were doing with the shield. So, so there's this, there's this weird thing where archeology span is the same thing that toddlers do. It's just that you need a PhD for it and you get paid. That's kind of cool. <laughs> well, assuming you get paid. Yeah, assuming you um, get paid. There's a, <laughs> there's a funny thing. So what we were doing is effectively experimental archaeology, which um, I, I think the name is a little bit funny because an experiment in the hard sciences is something that allows you to remove variables mm -hmm. and get closer and closer and closer to a genuine definitive answer of how the thing works and what its uh, conditions, yeah. I mean, what, what it is and how it works. But when you do it in experimental archaeology... Um, what you're actually doing is just trying to put an idea into practice to see how well it stacks up against reality. Mm -hmm. To see, is this something that, assuming people in the past thought, reason, were interested in comfort to the degree that I am, yeah. and were interested in things being efficient to the degree that I am, and, <clears throat> uh, you know, is this a solution that a, a person would work, yeah. would use, and, and would find appealing? Yeah. And, or, or even work at all in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And so picking up that shield and trying to figure out how it was used. The, the, it's interesting in combat um, that uh, an example of this sort of experimental archaeology is HEMA, mm -hmm. uh, the historical European martial arts groups online and in person. They are interested in trying to resurrect um, uh, historical European martial arts like uh, sword fighting. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing about those is that they uh, didn't get passed down, and so you have to... Uh, infer a whole lot and then we find these mm -hmm. four five and six hundred year old books that have pictures that show you how to fight with a sword mm -hmm. and trying to work off of that to try to reconstruct how it would be done mm -hmm. one of the assumptions that you can make is if it doesn't work you're doing it wrong mm -hmm. because in fighting uh, it, well, if it doesn't work, you die, and then you yeah. don't get to write your book about how to sword fight. Exactly. Well, and there are some limits on that, right? Like, I, I, it's not hard for me to imagine us finding texts that that give bad advice. Sure. Right? For the same reason that I can go take a textbook from the 70s that has, you know, uh, things in there that we now know are false. Right. Uh, you know, so there are limits on that inference, right? There could be some wrong things in there. Particularly but if it, the person who wrote it <laughs> had never actually done it. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's certainly a reasonable assumption that the stuff in that book was somewhere between functional and really good. That's yeah. certainly a good working assumption. And so the question is, okay, there's something here that I need to uncover, and it's something valuable. How am I going to do that? What is what is the thing? Right. Yep. It's it's hide and go seek. It's historical hide and go seek. It's interpretation all over again. Uh, you have some starting material to work off of, just like when you pull something out of the ground, um, and then and then you're right back to interpreting it and. The assumptions that you bring to that, I mean, you have to bring assumptions, are this thing works. Okay, how does it work? Um, okay, maybe I, it doesn't work the way I thought it did. And then eventually you figure out, oh, wow, okay, that really does work. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. you say, okay, maybe because this thing, that this new interpretation that I have works, I can, 
I mean, it's still an assumption to make that connection mm-hmm. and say this is the way it was done. We mm-hmm. don't know that for sure, yeah. but it becomes a much stronger assumption. Yeah. Well, and the, the interesting thing to me is that that is the exact same, same learning process that we engage in uh, when, when dealing with contemporary teachers and artifacts, right? Uh, is, uh, you know, or, or even, well, what the experience I'm thinking of is when I used to do uh, commercial and residential grounds maintenance, and I worked with my grandfather, and, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm like 12 years old doing this, I, I pretty much just do what he says for a couple of reasons. One, I'm 12 years old. Two, he knows way better than me, right? Um, but as, as, as time progresses, as I get, you know, to be 16, 18, um, 22 or so and so forth, right? Um, at, at different circumstances, I'll start pushing back and I'll be saying, hey, wait a second, Grandpa. I don't, I don't know if that's the smartest way to do this, right? Why don't we do it this way, right? And so even your engagement with, with teachers, um, with, with models and with, with any kind of learning experience, even, even engaging in a, in a contemporary setting as opposed to a historical setting, right? Is what you're doing is you're trying to piece together what it is that's going on and make the best possible interpretation of it. Yeah. Right? And so th- that gives me a lot of appreciation for archaeology um, as, as a like really legitimate enterprise, right? A very sophisticated enterprise. But the interesting thing to me is that it also, uh, for me, legitimizes all kinds of education and says, hey, wait a second, maybe we're looking at education in not the most helpful way possible. Like we could change our view of education as a as an iterative game of imitation and interpretation. Explain. Yeah, so um, I'm thinking, well, the the one that's that's coming to my mind is is, is that experience with my grandfather doing a commercial grounds and that one's that one's particularly interesting i mean from the outside mm-hmm. what what i'm hearing is at first you just do it because you've been told mm-hmm. and that's enough reason because you can make assumptions that he mm-hmm. knows what he's talking about yeah eventually you reach uh shall we say grounds maintenance parody with yeah. grandpa <laughs> where you are as competent at it as he is and at that point your interpretations i mean your your ability to say wait a minute, that assumption that he knows what he's doing is not always 100% grounded. Mm-hmm. Um, it's often grounded, and sometimes he knows things that you don't still. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you have something genuine to offer to the table and say, hey, what if we did it this way? And then Grandpa says, oh, wow, that's mm-hmm. actually a pretty good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is the process of, of apprenticeship. I just thought of another example that uh, illustrates this in a more cerebral field, which is um, uh, towards the early end of the 20th century, um, uh, regarding the Einsteinian revolution, um, all these scientists who are working through problems about the ether and so forth are saying, okay, we have been given a body of knowledge. All right. Um, but we find anomalies between that body of knowledge and our experience. So up until now, we've accepted that body of knowledge, the uh, Newtonian mechanics, as a given. We've taken it, you know, basically as axiomatic. We treat it like it's axiomatic, right? Um, but there are parts of it of our experience that it doesn't... Uh, that it doesn't properly describe. Right? This is it doesn't like the, seem to describe the Morrison well. Morley experiment, where yeah. they uh, were looking for anomalies. Basically, um, the, the setup of the Morrison Morley experiment kind of looks like LIGO mm-hmm. uh, to me, like the, the 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 massive interferometry thing that they used to detect gravitational waves. Uh, but they, they ran this experiment assuming that the ether would be moving or they would be moving through yeah. the ether and they'd have a difference in the measurement of the speed mm-hmm. of light between two arms and didn't find it. And so mm-hmm. they had to say, well, I guess we're not moving through the ether. Mm-hmm. Uh, there goes the ether theory. Yeah. And so the ether, if it exists, doesn't do anything and therefore, functionally speaking, does not exist. Okay. Even if it does, it may as well not. Um, yeah, exactly. Right. So th- these are the kinds of experiments that I'm that I'm, that I'm I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, where the, the scientists of this time are... <sighs> They're, they're looking at data and trying to figure out the best possible interpretation for it. Okay, well, that's what you do in archaeology. Right? The difference is that you're doing it, in the case of the scientists, you're doing it with comp- contemporary data instead of historical data. This brings up two points that I, I find most interesting. So the archaeological game, it's everywhere. Apparently, mm-hmm. we're doing it all the time in every field of education. Every, every time we get any sort of inf- information, we are interpreting it. Yeah. Um, in archaeology specifically, in touring, at, touring this museum with Lloyd, uh, the two things that came most to my mind were, A, there's room for error, um, mm-hmm. that this process is not as definitive as we like to imagine it. Uh-huh. You go and into a museum, you, see, you read the, the, you read the, the captions, plaque. and you're like, oh, okay, oh, that's, that's what, what happened. That's what it is. That's the experts happened. say so. Yeah. And sometimes, uh, sometimes maybe not. Um, sometimes there's good reasons to believe that that mm-hmm. is not the case. And well, and in 10 years, like the archaeologists are going to be disagreeing with each other about that. Yeah. So there's there's room for your own interpretation and for the, the individual to 
uh, mm-hmm. participate in that process, which for one thing makes going to museums way, way more fun. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we continued this process visiting museums in Oxford mm-hmm. and, and London and uh, touring around the Ashmolean Museum and looking at things and looking at the plaques and saying, I'm not sure that I buy that. Mm-hmm. Um, and reading other ones and saying, yep, yep, can't see a way around that one. Yep. Mm-hmm. It yeah. was it was fun to be that engaged mm-hmm. in the process rather than as just a spectator in the in the museum. As an example of this process, you know, tying it to what I was saying about um, the the process of moving through physics and uh, developing Einsteinian mechanics out of Newtonian mechanics, um, is uh, while we're there at Vendolanda, we talk about the battle standard, right? Sure. This little horse figurine, and the little plaque says, "Well, this is a battle standard, right?" And Lloyd is like, well, I don't think that's a battle standard because how are you going to see it in battle? That's not very helpful. Which is, again, that functional critique. That's that experimental mm-hmm. archaeology. He's finding experiment. an anomaly and trying to f- figure out the best way to, uh, the best interpretation of it. If that. I was trying to use it as that, it wouldn't mm-hmm. work. Therefore, I infer that it wasn't used for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool stuff. Yeah. Um, I, for me, it's all about humility. The, this, this interpretation game. The first, um, mm-hmm. the, the humility of the expert to say, hey, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, or at least the the space for us to participate, and then the second is just the the humility that we as observers should have as well. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's both parts. All of us, the ex- experts included, and the observers mm-hmm. are, or let's say the non-experts are interpreting, and that means there's a little bit of squish, and that means that there's uh, some humility uh, that is appropriate mm-hmm. in this whole process. Mm-hmm. And that humility is itself the precursor to knowledge. Right? Yeah, like it's, it's like the, the questions. It's the thing that, that gives birth to the process that creates knowledge. You don't, you're not paying attention until you have questions. Um, yeah. You're not seeing it clearly, you could say, until, mm-hmm. you're, until you're asking questions. Yeah. And that is a cool thing, because those admit where you are ignorant. I also just want to talk about the, the sheer entertainment value of doing this. Thing, yes. Right? Because how many times have you walked into a museum and you just kind of like wander around and you read the plaque and you look at the thing and you're like, okay, well, that's a thing. And this it has like, nothing to do with me. Yeah. And like, it, it's very hard to, sometimes it's very hard. Like you go in and you're duly impressed because there's all these artifacts or maybe it's yeah. an art museum and you're like, okay, they painted this and you know, there you go. Right. Um, so you're, you're duly impressed, right. As, as one of the unwashed masses that have come into, to, 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 right? yeah. But, um, but it's not that engaging or interesting or exciting, you know, a lot of the time, right? And it actually turns out that you can have a much more exciting and interesting and engaging time in museums if you try arguing with the plaques. It turns and, it into a conversation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? Which and has it, a place for you. I mean, it's not just listening yeah. to a lecture. It is you participating in yeah. this thing. And, you know, there's a good chance that the plaque will wrestle you to the ground and pin you because metaphorically, right? Um, but there's a good chance that the plaque or its, its, its explanation will wrestle you to the ground and pin you because, hey, you know, like these people actually have thought about these things. There's a really good chance that they're right, you know? Uh, and it's not like you can't learn something from those plaques. Absolutely, right? Uh, uh, but you're going to, you're never going to know whether or not they're trustworthy unless you poke back a little. Right? Yeah. And you'll actually have a much more exciting time if you poke back and do your own. Well, and this is also true for art museums, by the way is if you go to our museums, it's very easy to just sort of like read the plaques and just sort of like get snowed over by 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 the sensory input, right? I think there's some sort of statistic, I can't recall it precisely, but it's something like that the average person looks at an art museum exhibit for like seven seconds, right? And and you know, part of it is if you're not educated in art criticism, if you if you aren't familiar with sort of these processes, that's then you a just picture, that's you just sort of walk it. Yeah, picture, you're like that's a picture. That's a picture, man, and the plaque says this, and so okay, like that's cool, but there's nothing more. Like there's nothing very interesting here, man, right? Um, whereas if you if you are uh, pushing back against those plaques, you know, uh, providing providing some tension and resistance, asking your own questions, uh, it actually makes it a much more engaging process, and you'll mm-hmm. actually probably have a much more fun time like staring at five paintings in that museum rather than going around and seeing all uh, 550 paintings for seven seconds each. Yeah. So. So engagement, that's one of the, the takeaways from their interpretation game is yeah. the ability to enjoy it because you're participating. Yeah. And and that, that that participation actually like does engender enjoyment or at least absence of boredom. Right? Or at, at least, least absence, absence of, of boredom. boredom. Yep. Right. Which, which might be a triumph in itself. That might be an accomplishment in itself. Yep. So. Yep. I can see that. Um, well, this has been tremendously cool. In the the shield video, in particular, that was it was it was so fun to participate in that process. I, I'm not going to claim to be any sort of expert. That's mm-hmm. not what that video was about. It was about us trying to figure out how to use a Roman shield. Mm-hmm. And after 
we figured out that uh, carrying it is really convenient. It's kind of the briefcase carry. Yeah. And so if you're marching, that makes sense. But when you get your elbow propped up, then it works reasonably well. Mm-hmm. And we have to assume it worked reasonably well because it was standard issue for for a long time. I mean, you assume that they could have figured out to put the handle vertically or diagonally if the horizontal thing wasn't working out for them. Or even to have like a uh, little wing nut so that they could change yeah. it. <laughs> okay, battle's about to start. Now change that's, your shields. That's a great idea, right? Yeah. That's a great Switch idea. Switch it between the two. Well, and actually, I don't know if we mentioned that when we were there, but you're making me realize that... Uh, if I'm imagining myself carrying my shield for long periods of time, just walking around, not fighting, and I would definitely pre- prefer the horizontal. Oh, handhold. beyond a doubt. Yeah, the vertical handhold look j- so awkward, so yep. awkward. With a circular shield, I'm imagining there, there's no functional difference between the two because when you carry it, you carry it horizontal, and when you fight with it, you fight oh, yeah, with the circle. Circuit, yeah, there's no difference. Right? There's, yeah, there's a shield. You, you can you can you can switch it around however yep. you like, right? Yep. But a but an oblong or rectangular shield uh, places some constraints on you, so you actually do want to get the handle right. That's interesting. Gosh. Okay, so the interpretation game. Uh, Good stuff all around. There's another thing I want to say about that, but first I want to take just one second to tell you guys about Audible. Audible is a massive provider of online content of all shapes, sizes, flavors, kinds, genres, and every every conceivable division of human knowledge you can imagine, Audible has it pretty much. Um, So they supply audiobooks. uh, Not just audiobooks, a lot of other kinds of audio content too, um, which is fantastic. You can get a free trial of Audible um, using our code, and that also helps support the channel, audibletrial.com slash goodandbasic. And um, if you are specifically interested in archaeology, then I, I recommend three lecture series this by Edwin Barnhart about the archaeology of the Americas. He did one on the archaeology of North America, one on the archaeology of Mesoamerica, which is very, very long, and I'm currently working through it, and one on the archaeology of the Lost Worlds of South America, and that one is fascinating. So all three of these are fascinating and, and worth your time. Yeah, so uh, we'll link to those in the show notes. One of the cool things about Audible um, is actually that it has a... I don't know if it has all of them. I actually do not know. Um, but it does have the Great Courses lectures on it. It has huge numbers of the Great Courses lectures, right? Which is uh, yep. what you're listening to. It's this archaeology series, right? Um, I've listened to a couple of them too, um, which is really cool. You know, you could go buy the Great Courses series, or you could get an Audible subscription and get the Great Courses series plus tons of other content. Yep. Right, so uh, real winner for sure. Real winner. Um, so uh, if you do want to use our uh, trial code, it's audibletrial.com slash goodandbasic. Go ahead and um, go to that link, and then you can use Audible, and uh, fountains of knowledge will pour upon your head through your ears. You get a month free, and then there's no obligation after that necessarily. Uh, whatever you get using your free credit, you keep, and then it, it's worth using. It's something yeah. that we've both used for a long time. Uh, we're both big fans of it. So uh, if that sounds like the kind of thing you're interested in, we heartily endorse it um, and encourage you to go check that out. So, um, okay, uh, so here's the thing that I wanted to say about the interpretation game that we touched on. We've, we've touched on it in the videos briefly, um, right, is the the religious artifact thing. Right? Oh, yeah. So you f- you find something and you're like, well, I have no idea what this thing is. Like, okay. It's for a little, uh, little horse figurine, ritual. right? Like, or a little, like, round-bellied woman, right? You're like, oh, religious ritual. Right. Yep. Um, so what are your thoughts about that? Like, why is... Because we both laugh at that, and we both think it's kind of funny and interesting. So what's so funny and interesting about that? Part of it is just the inside joke. <laughs> so among archaeologists, uh, it, it is an inside joke that if you have no idea what something is for, you say it's for uh, ritual. Mm-hmm. And then that explains it away. Um, but really, the inside joke is when you say it's for ritual, it means we have absolutely no idea. Uh, one thing that I have... Uh, I mentioned it this in another previous video from about a year and a half ago. Um, Mm -hmm. I was talking about this large stone sphere that is on the the university campus, and it's uh, it's from Colombia, and there's a number of these things. Uh, Was it Colombia or Costa Rica? I think it's Costa Rica. And there's lots of these large carved uh, igneous rock Mm -hmm. spheres, and some of them are quite large. And Mm -hmm. the culture that made them was uh, Stone Age in their technology, which means the way that they're carving these is with the the peck method, and so you can imagine the raw amount of time. You look just at that artifact and you just rocks see. Together. You can see the man hours. Ugh. Many, many, many. Well, how many of these rocks of are there? Are there? There's there's a huge number. Of these there's rocks. hundreds. I can't remember of them. how many it is. They're in various in sizes. Number. Some of them are bowling ball sized, and some of them are are as big as me, um, like six feet and more in diameter. Um, and these. These things are huge. <clears throat> now, the question is, why did someone make them? Because mm-hmm. you know two things about them. One, they're not natural. People made them. Mm-hmm. And the second is, the person who made them had to spend a lot of time not doing anything else 
in order to make them. Mm -hmm. So that's time that you're not uh, collecting food, that's time that you're not spending with your family, that's time that you're not uh, doing anything productive, shall we say. Or even very fun, right? You're not even like swimming or cliff jumping or doing cliff diving or doing anything fun like that, right? You're you're sitting next to a rock hitting it with another rock. Like, come on, man. Yep, focused and repeated packing it with a rock and may- maybe uh maybe it's a boredom release thing mm-hmm. maybe it's uh, a detention <laughs> exercise in their schools like we don't See, know it, well that's the qu- like right like maybe it was valuable not because they wanted round rocks but because they were punishing somebody <laughs> totally <laughs> well, well but you can imagine someone in 500 years or 5,000 years it might take 5,000 years like looking back at our prisons and being like what are these for they lock these people up and uh they just do nothing all day what's going on you know, they're they're monks in some hypothetical future where you don't need, yeah, where, where you, you don't, don't need prisons, prisons. I, I, and don't remember what they were because yeah. the records weren't maintained. Right. But the the two things that we know are people made them, and mm-hmm. that it took an enormous amount of time, mm-hmm. not doing something productive. Mm-hmm. And from those, you can infer that they cared deeply about making them. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's an inference, but it's an inference that's quite reasonable. Is to say that for one reason or another, they cared to the amount of finishing. Yeah, and that's yeah, you, a lot of caring. They made a value decision and said, I like the the world in which I have a round carved rock is better than the world that I don't have a round carved rock. Yeah, despite the hundreds of man hours it takes to carve this thing by pecking with another rock. Mm -hmm. And so that those sets of inferences together say, okay, they cared deeply. And if they cared deeply and we don't know why, and we can't attach it to any sort of material consideration of like feeding yourself, clothing yourself, sheltering yourself, any of that stuff, then you start to say, well, some set of value that's not directly attached to the material hence ritual mm-hmm. um, it, it's it's some sort of ethereal or, or pure value that mm-hmm. you're seeking through yeah. doing this thing mm-hmm. and we don't get it and so that goes in the ritual category well and th- so what's is so interesting to me about this question besides the fact that obviously it's hilarious um, <laughs> is that what I hear when archaeologists say this thing was used for religious ritual what I hear is we don't know yep what I hear is we don't know. And and the reason why is because if you say that something was used for religious ritual, it's like, that doesn't explain anything in my view, right? Yep. Like, I don't think that just because I describe it as religious ritual that it means that I have any real understanding of what that person was experiencing through that religious ritual, right? Like, I do not understand what people get out of peyote ceremonies or ayahuasca ceremonies. I don't understand what... Um, yeah, Egyptian temples. I yeah. mean, that you mentioned when we, we were once asked on the live stream Q and A uh, if we were could be a farmer in one of yeah. various eons of the past. Which one would it be? And you yeah. said ancient Egypt. Yeah. So that you could understand the, yeah, so the, the temples. Yeah. I, and I don't know if I'd get to as a farmer, but that was that was the way I took the question. Right? Is I want to understand those temples because there's these people building things, right? And they're doing things, right? Similar to the rocks, and it's clearly very meaningful to them, right? And I can stand from the outside and say, "This is meaningful to them. This is religious it's ritual, meaningful right?" Because of ritual, yeah. yeah. But it's like that—that wh- that doesn't tell me anything. Like, in, in the same way that uh, you know, like clinical clinical descriptions. C.S. Lewis talks about this in, in one of his essays, and I think he's absolutely right. That if you describe clinically and chemically the experience of being in love, it's like, okay, that is a technically accurate description. You're not wrong. But there's a lot that you're missing here, right? Like you're missing the full the full thrust of the experience, right? And that's, and so the fact that you have that kind of clinical descriptive knowledge, uh, you know, that's nice, right? But it should not blind you to the fact that there is a world of knowledge that you are missing, right? And so in the same way, right? Like when I see that, you know, like at Archeon, we visited a, a, a replica Roman shrine, right? Like, and I stood inside and I was trying to figure out like, what are these people getting out of this, right? Like clearly they are, right? And it, 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 it's pure historical snobbery and arrogance for me to, to merely dismiss it and say, there is nothing meaningful going on here. Now that doesn't mean that I have to build a Roman shrine and worship Zeus and Hera and whoever else, right? But I, but I ought to at least have the decency and consideration to say these were human beings and something was going through their heads and hearts and I don't know what that is. And, and one of the reasons why this is so interesting to me, sorry, I know, I know you want to say something. One of the reasons why this is so interesting to me is because this is often how I feel with my own religious experiences as I'm like, look, I can step outside for myself for a second and I understand that looking from the outside, you may not understand my religious experiences. That's okay. But I would like you to at least acknowledge that I am experiencing something, right? And that you may not have full access to that. Right. There are, there are pieces of this that you don't know. And so, you know, we can disagree about religion and, you know, very fair, right? Like I don't, 
it's it's very reasonable i think to disagree about religion right i think it's very reasonable um but but there's there's knowledge here that i don't have when i look at quote unquote religious artifacts right and and i don't i i don't think it's fair to 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 dismiss that knowledge out of hand even though i think it's appropriate to be skeptical to some degree or another while approaching it anyway sorry that that there there's my spiel joseph uh, go ahead and go ahead and amen <laughs> Well, thank First you. of all, amen. Thank you. But uh, the, sec- the second part of that, I think, is empathy. Uh, mm-hmm. As we're as we're doing the interpretation game, yeah, uh, you need to uh, experience empathy. By which I mean, try to understand mm-hmm. it as they did, mm-hmm. rather than the the external, like you were saying, the, mm-hmm. the chem- chemical description of what's going on when mm-hmm. you're in love, and saying, "Oh, I observe these behaviors. Isn't that fascinating?" Mm-hmm. But uh, observing observing your younger brother like he was a wild animal to to bring up the... Well, actually, he was observing his older brother, so I mean... Probably even more realistic. But (laughs) (laughs) But, um, the the experience of of ritual in particular, you want to understand it from the inside, not from the outside, because Mm -hmm. from the outside, maybe it makes no sense, Mm -hmm. but from the inside, you start to get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's um, putting yourself into someone's shoes trying to to understand what it is that they're getting out of it i mean mm-hmm. there's i uh, i want to say a, another level of humility there yeah yeah like there, there's something honorable in trying to step into someone else's shoes it's that empathy to say i i try to understand as you do which empathy is a very weird place to end up with archaeology but on some level it's like okay i have these artifacts but what do they mean yep and the only way i can sort of start to understand that is by seeing how they relate to other things, right? Um, including how it relates to me and to the people and how the people related to each other, right? Like, there is an, 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 a level, there, there is a kind of empathy that is applicable here, right? That, like, I might, I might actually be missing things if I don't have that empathy. Yeah. I might, I might not understand the archaeological artifacts properly. On, on the material side, it could be as simple as understanding where you get <clears throat> blisters when you're using an ancient shovel. Yeah. Um, I mean, to, to put that's yourself empathy. in their shoes, that, that's an empathy, that's stepping into their experience. But on the, the religious side, on the, the ritual side, to mm-hmm. understand the significance that they put into this and to say they, they're not faking it. Mm-hmm. It's, very, uh, it's, it's a modern arrogance mm-hmm. that commonly attends discussions of religion to say, oh, well, I mean... If, if they had brains, then they wouldn't be doing that mm-hmm. in the first place. And uh, clearly, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's all hocus-pocus and nonsense. But uh, to, to step into the shoes and say, no, 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 no. They, they cared to the amount mm-hmm. of sitting for hundreds of hours carving this stone mm-hmm. wall. And so you can't dismiss that out of hand without understanding what they were experiencing at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I actually think to jump back to last week's podcast very briefly because we we're done with all that crushing morosity, right? Sure. We don't have a care in the world. Everything is going to be fine. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think this is a really helpful thing to do not only with people who have a different religion than you or, or no religion or some religion when you don't have a religion, but it's also a very helpful thing to do with politics, right? To uh, to look at people who you disagree with and try to really figure out what they're thinking. And that doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but to really try to to at least treat something about that as valid. Right. And it's a it's a difficult thing to do. And and it's it's difficult also to walk the line between understanding somebody and still disagreeing with them. I, I would articulate it as seeing the value as they see it. Mm-hmm. So uh, trying to understand what they care about and why they care about it mm-hmm. as being something worth caring about. Mm-hmm. And then just put yourself in that frame for a minute and you don't have to continue to care about it. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, it might not be something worth caring about, mm-hmm. but stepping into that paradigm for a moment mm-hmm. will, I mean, it changes the discussion radically. It certainly changes the way I've looked at things. So. Sure. Can confirm, can confirm. Gosh, interpretation has led us to empathy and politics. Yeah. Wow. Uh, this but is just more igloo conversation, right? We're that's uh, going around in circles, going up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but in like time. a very, yeah, in a, in a helpful, productive, ascending way. It's a spiral yeah. staircase, we like to think so. Well, uh, I think that's a good place as any to, to finish the podcast. I agree. Uh, thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate your support. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you are interested in more of our material, then you can find lots of it on YouTube. We have well over 200 videos, mm-hmm. um, including a number about interpretation of various archaeological stuffs. Yeah, so, and I, well, and I'm realizing we've got a little bit more content to put out there because I filmed a video in the British Museum that uh, we talked about briefly today that we I, I had totally forgotten about. So there's more stuff uh, coming. We will we will have more stuff coming. Also, it's worth mentioning. Sorry, we should have mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast. If you do want to help support the podcast, you can go to well, you could get an Audible trial is one thing, but you could also go to um, anchor.fm 
and they have a tool there where you can um, donate to help support the podcast. Um, if you're interested in that, and if this is if the podcast is valuable to you, um, we sure appreciate it. Um, it helps much. make sure that we can keep churning out the content and produce better content in the future. So, um, in either case, thank you very much. Uh, this is good fun for us. We hope it's good fun for you. So, amen again. Thank you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>